Good evening and welcome to Tinker Tailor Solar Fly here on the Mighty Loading Ready Live Video Entertainment Network. My name's Ian Horner and joining me tonight, as often as the case, is Cameron Lauder. Huh? Whoop. <laughs> How's it going, everyone? <laughs> Hope we're all having a wonderful night here back, back at the table, back in the lab after a good, good desert bus. And we've got, mm. whew, we've got projects that we need to get working on here because oh, yeah. one day we'd like to finish these things up. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, sure, let's do that. Yeah, so you're going to be continuing to work on the uh, silver, silver Tower miniatures. Yes. Which ones are you going to be working on today? Uh, I'm going to be working on, uh, let's see, the... Uh, we've got the Fire Slayer, mm -hmm. which I need to finish today. The Doom Weaver, the Fire Slayer Doom Weaver. And then we've got the uh, Tenebriel Shard. Tenebriel Shard? Yeah, some kind of shadow spiky man. Mm. He seems to be a kind of Cenobite with very, more spikes. Very bladey. Yeah. And, with more spikes? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. They did it. <laughs> Games Workshop finally figured out that problem. We found a, a new spot for spikes. We need mm. more small pointy edges on our minis. Agreed. I mean, it's really the hallmark of uh, Games Workshop. And tonight I'll be uh, doing up some more work on the uh, leather bag that I've been putting together. It's been mm. sitting here. The leather has been, uh, or the, rather the Rubber cement has been curing all through Desert Bus. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're going to do is uh, get the get the holes punched in here and start maybe the, some of the sewing before we move on to project two, which will be working on an oscilloscope uh, solder it yourself project. Neat. I'm very excited for that. And bonus project for you all. We're going to get to see, uh, take a look inside Ian's uh, mini acquisition project. Mini by which I mean Rover Mini, uh, the vehicle as uh, there's an auction going on in, in Japan right now, and uh, the inspection is a little bit late, so we'll be coming in hot when we Ooh. find out whether or not we'll be putting in a bed, bid for that. So we might as well uh, get to it. This, yeah, is, absolutely. this is the bag that we've been, uh, we've been working on, and true to form, I have not actually done any work on it yet, but I've maybe made some mistakes. Oh, that's what we do here. Yep, we make mistakes and then we learn to either live with them or fix them. Mm. The mistake this time that I'm learning about, and I think it'll probably be fine, I'll bet we can buff that right out, is I've managed to put the, uh, you can see there, I managed to mark the leather with the, uh, what do you call it, these bulldog clips? Oh no, right, yes. But that'll... It should come out, I mean, at the very least we can probably steam it out, mm. just mm -hmm. give it a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of uh, water there. Maybe, maybe actually what you do, I think, you probably do it the same way that you take dents out of uh, soft wood, mm. which is to just put down a, a soft cloth, mm -hmm. a slightly damp soft cloth, and then just iron it, and that should cause everything to oh, re reinflate. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's my hope. That's what I'm going to try if it starts to bother me. But other than that, I'd say around the edges that uh, the tongue depressor method Worked rather well. Oh, yeah. So we've got some marks there from where things happened. Also, got to take better pro better care of my projects as I leave them be in this office. Because one of the days when I came back to check on this while it was drying, some people decided to just toss a big box of magic cards on top, which was... Not good. No, not, not helpful to the procedure at all. Look, if... If you leave anything in this office, it's going to have magic yeah. cards on top of it. It's That's good. just how it works. So I've tested a corner here, and yeah, you can see that the while it is uh, adhered in place, mm -hmm. it's not permanent. This is going to come apart pretty easily when we start tugging on it, mm -hmm. which is fine. That's fine. It's just there to hold it in place while we, while we make our holes and make it ready to sew. Which is what we're going to do today. We're going to start by putting some holes in this. So let's get out the tooling and put away all of our things for next time. Nope, that's where we keep our Gundams. We have a Gundam hole? We, we, we do. This is where we used to keep our tools. It is now empty. <laughs> yes. That's, huh. That sounds alarming. It, 
little outlines of all the tools. Yeah. Uh, An IOU here. I'm trying to remember whether or not that's my fault. <laughs> Thankfully, the, the leather tools are still here. Were they taken for Desert Bus? They might have been taken for Desert Bus. They might have been taken by me for Desert Bus. Hmm. But we'll, I guess, find that out uh, later. Uh, what I do need, though, and uh, maybe you can help me with that, or... Ian, could you, um, with the uh, antenna on your mic pack, it's caught on something, and it's uh, kind of cutting your... Okay, it's in my pocket right now, so it shouldn't be catching on anything. But I'll extend it out so that it's nice and... Yeah. Drew pressure marks. The leather surface can be heated with a hairdryer or a heat gun. Then try to remove the pressure mark by massaging the leather. Push and roll the leather from all sides. Try to bulge and lift the pressure mark. Also cool down rapidly the area with the heat after heating with cold iron or cooling element. Thank you, Mark by Dynamo. That seems to be pretty much on, uh, on do with what I was planning to do. Uh, Matthew, could you get me a hammer from the, uh, the thing in the other room? So this is some sort of uh, Dwarven Berserker you got going on here? It is. Uh, as people in chat have pointed out earlier, um, the story behind the particular red mohawked dwarves has changed in the new lore uh, because, you know, the world was broken and put back together again. So um, what used to be Dwarven Slayers, who were dwarves who had in some way or other dishonored themselves and then uh, as a way of atoning, would go out into the world to seek the biggest and scariest monsters they could find and then be <laughs> stepped on by them. Um, they are now mercenaries in the New World Order, I guess. Um, I, I al always... Boring. Yeah, I always really like the old Slayer lore in that the um, worst Slayers were the ones that, you know, made their way up to Demon Slayer. Right? You started off with Troll Slayers and most, most dwarves failed to become Troll Slayers. Um, but the ones that failed to slay or be slain by the trolls had to go looking for ogres and then onto dragons and or no troll giant mm -hmm. dragon and then finally demon slayers were the least successful slayers they're the ones who brought the most dishonor on themselves uh, they were there to be stepped on by demons yeah unfortunately by that point they had become quite proficient at killing things so. oh no why won't you just kill me? All right. So again, difficult to film this, but what we're going to do is we're going to use these these guys. Oh, hey, hello, overhead, to punch holes at a regular interval down the uh, down the edge. Then we'll start sewing them in. But I'm not going to punch all the way across the top of the other edge here. Well, you know what, maybe I will, but I'm going to start the timing based on the bottom layer, which is smaller than these. And it says, Ian, I'm seeing two Austin Minis, one 30th anniversary, one Countryman Woody for sale in BC for 12520 respectively. Yes, those exist. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why I'm, in, uh, why I'm uh, looking to install, or not install, uh, Acquire? import from Japan. Import. Mm -hmm. Because I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking to put down a bid of 630,000 yen, which translates to roughly 6,300 US. Hmm. And that's uh, a much better price than 20,000. Yeah. Or 12,000. So do they just put it onto a container ship and then ship it over? Not even that. They, uh, they put it onto the roll-on, roll-off auto-shipping ships. Oh, really? So they literally just drive it onto a ship, which mm -hmm. then has a, uh, a ramp that takes you to different levels within the ship. Oh, it's okay. It's tied into uh, hard points on the ship, so okay. it doesn't move. roll around, right? Yeah. and then just rolls directly off. Okay, so like a parkade that floats. Yeah. With obviously better hardware. Yeah. And it's it's much cheaper to ship them that way than it is to ship, th uh, ship them via container ship. Hmm. The fun thing is that regardless of whether it's roll on or roll off, uh, they're shipped base or the cost of shipping is based on uh, cubic meters. Oh, as it would be, not by weight or anything else, but by how the volume. Volume, yeah. Right. So I'm very happy that I'm uh, looking to purchase one of the smallest cars ever made in terms of volume. <laughs> nice. Save some cash there. Okay, perfect. Right into the wood. Right. 
that's why I left this in here. Hmm. Oh, oh, you're making holes for uh, sewing? Yes. Is it right on I always it? wondered how you did that. Yeah, you can do it by hand with mm -hmm. using a sewing awl mm -hmm. or just a standard uh, sewing ne needle. But uh, if you want these nicely uh, mm -hmm. arranged, nicely ordered, right. uniform hits, you definitely want some of these forks. I, uh, years and years ago, I bought a, um, a Romanian army surplus great coat, oh. which was... It looked like it was in the picture, you know, a very nice green, and then I got it, and it was like, it was heavy wool. Mm -hmm. It was it was a very nice garment, actually. But it, the the green that they had used to dye it showed up under fluorescent lights as like this electric green, which oh, made me as a chemist no. think, this has been dyed with some kind of transition metal dye, right? Yeah. Like, this, this is probably like, anyway, I, I went to get it taken in because mm -hmm. it was like square coat. Um, and I went to a tailor and they, they were like, they took my measurements and pinned it and, uh, then called me back the next day saying that it had bent all their sewing machines mm. and that I needed to take it to Vlad. Ah, yes, Vlad. Have I told this story? Vlad mm. the leather worker? No, you have, uh, you've given me the start of the story, but I've oh. never actually had heard the end okay. of it. Okay, so if someone tells you that there's one man in town who can, uh, sew leather, like, uh, sew heavyweight, strong wearing leather gear mm -hmm. and his name is Vlad. Who do you picture? <laughs> I mean, he's he's got to be large. Yeah, he, he's wearing the rawest of uh, of cable knit sweaters, probably I, in green or brown. I picture someone who looks like the lead singer from uh, Metalocalypse, crossed with Cal Drogo. Yeah, right. Uh, and you know, he just kind of lowers in from the roof of his shop mm -hmm. on a harness, <laughs> and there's just. You know, all kinds of shit hanging from the ceilings. And I go into there with this expectation, and Vlad is just a small man who mainly works on people's hockey pads. Huh. And occasionally, like, uh, will we'll alter a uh, leather coat. That's unfortunate. And, you know, he was wearing, like, a, um, a polo shirt that was tucked into sweatpants. <laughs> yeah, that's that tracks with yeah. the other Vlads I know of. Yeah, and I'm like... And he's okay. like, yeah, we can do this. And he just, like, <laughs> runs it through the sewing machine <laughs> that is used to sew hockey pads. And, wow. You know, no, that's 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 impressive. Mm -hmm. But I don't doubt that from the from that quality of wool. Yeah. Did I ever tell you about the, one of the first projects I made in uh, 4-H? No. Well, it was, this was a a, a, a wool coat. Mm -hmm. It was based off of a uh, a pattern that, in my mind, the pattern kind of looked like a Starfleet jacket in the uh, like the Star Trek, uh, like oh, not Insurrection, First Contact era. Okay. So you know you had the gray shoulder. Pants, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that rounded up collar, which was just a bit larger. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I kind of modeled after that in terms of colors, mm -hmm. which meant it got very thick. Yeah. And I lost three sewing machine needles <laughs> in that coat. I'd believe it. In the sense that they broke off and I couldn't find but... them anywhere in the area. <laughs> so they're in the coat. Beautiful. I've looked at leather sewing machines as a thing, or possibly even converting old treadle sewing machines into leather mm -hmm. work, but it's... Boy, that's a different world. I think I'm going to stick with hand stitching for the moment. Hmm. That does I, mean... My impression of leather working gear, which to be fair is based on like uh, lots of those uh, very very nice documentaries about people who are, you know, making whatever wallets in the old fashioned way mm -hmm. with lots of really, uh, shallow depth of field shots of yep. working. But my impression is that it requires uh, a large number of sort of custom, uh, particularly shaped like metal prongs <laughs> of different types. Yeah. <laughs> So, now this is the fun thing. I, I, I bought this kit off of eBay. Oh, hold up. And it's, uh, you know, it's got a bunch of tools in it of various metal sizes and shapes. And I don't actually need 
the majority of these. I haven't needed to actually do the work. I mean, oh, this wow. is, you, also, yeah. Yeah, I'll go, wow. I'll go through those Neat. in a second because uh, I've just got the pre-inspection report back from my guy in Japan. And so it's time to find out if we're putting in a bid tonight or not. Is this now an eBay channel? Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. He's given me uh, a do, text description. Do we need to move the, uh, the stream over to a 30 minute delay? <laughs> So you don't get sniped? <laughs> Thankfully, no, because uh, while these are auction-based, they're not eBay-style. Oh, okay. The, uh, he was working as a broker because these auctions kind of happen on computers, but you have to be registered in a registered auction mm. seller in order to actually take part in them. Uh, let's see here. Engine starts idly and revs fine. No smoke or vibrations, no sludge. Coolant level and color are okay. Engine slightly oily from valve cover down, forming drops in the bottom of the engine. Tires have 60% but cracked. Spare okay. No leaks, mold, or rust in trunk. Undercarriage surface rust only, very important on a Mini. Drive shaft boots cracking but not torn, that's kind of normal for uh, the drive shaft. Uh, headlight chrome surface rust corrosion spots, that's fine, that's, cro that's the chrome rust corrosion underneath door weather strip. Windshield chips small, seats good, dashboard okay, interior matches mileage, ceiling liner dirty, no burns. AC okay, clutch okay, gears okay, check lamps okay, fog lamps don't turn on, but other lights work okay, wipers are okay. Well, that'll be a fun one to troubleshoot. Yep. Yeah, well, fog lamps. Oh, that's probably easy. They might not have even been, uh, given how many of these come back with the fog light lamps don't turn on, mm -hmm. they might not have even been hooked up. Right, right, right. Yeah. This is your man in Japan. Yep. He's got, well, it's a very, it's a very detailed, obviously this person knows, uh, what you're interested in, in terms of... Oh yes, we well, they, they were nice enough to give me a uh, uh, an interview beforehand to find out what I'm interested in. Huh. Arclight uh, asks, no burns? Well, this is something you have to worry about in Japan, where smoking is a lot more prevalent than it is here. Ah, on the... Oh, okay, right. Which is also part of the, why they're reporting whether or not there are smells in, on the interior. Mm. Like, I have seen a few that actually have uh, cigarette burns or have weird aftermarket ashtrays that are put on a gooseneck and just kind of put up. Huh. So, yeah, the, uh, the oily from the, the uh, gasket down thing being uh, an issue on the engine, all of, these, uh, all of these engines are oily. It's a, it's a British Mini. Yeah, like yeah. the uh, little loose tolerances. Yeah, like if, if, I, if it wasn't a, uh, if, if it wasn't this way on every, uh, Mini, I'd be concerned, mm. but this one seems pretty fine. So, uh, yeah, let's say okay. And bid. Yep. Quick reply. Sounds good. Go ahead and put in the bid for 63.0.0.0.0. Many thanks as always. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, uh, I like that it's from post-war Britain, it's a little shit, and that's normal. <laughs> oh no, it's from, it's from New Zealand, from 1997, I believe. Oh. Because they made them up till 2000 in mm. New Zealand for the Asian and uh, Southeast, Southern Pacific market. Oh, okay. So this, this is the only way to get a, uh, a late model Mini. Hmm. Or one of the few ways. Engine is also less of a problem because that's something that I've considered replacing. Mm. There are basically bolt-in conversion kits these days for classic minis to really? put in either a six-cylinder Honda mm -hmm. with VTEC for fun, or a uh, a high-powered motorcycle engine mm. for weight savings and also ridiculous power increases. <laughs> that wasn't quite enough on that one there. Okay. So let's hit this again. And then let's go over some of these tools that I don't know how to work. It's so are you, are you turning uh, Tinker Taylor Solder Fry into um, CAD, this, <laughs> mini? <laughs> Ooh, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no stopping you from taking a car down. And or I don't, would, would it be more FOP, this mini? <laughs> FOP? FOP. I'm trying to think of what the the very British equivalent of pimp would be. Mm, yeah. Pimp my ride. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fop sounds better. Yeah, I think so. 
But yeah, so tool-wise, well, getting back to leather, you've got this guy, which is just used for cutting, which ironically is Japanese in origin as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got this screw punch. Ooh, hold up. Just want to get my cover on that there, because I assume that that's very sharp. This appears to be a, a pretty complete set here. It is. The screw punch I especially love because it's, you push in and it screws as it punches down. So it turns. <clears throat> <laughs> yes. Cool. I, I say nothing. Nope. I return no. Put that away. So screw punch. Uh, this. Goodbye. My foot. Oh, you didn't need. You didn't need a hole for your foot anyway. Yeah, just rolls onto the ground. You hear. <laughs> this I found out last uh, or a couple of things ago is just made for uh, marking edges. Mm -hmm. Just oh. make sure it's a. Uh, parallel? Exactly. Well, parallel or a certain distance away from the edge. Oh, okay. So, sort of like a compass in that respect. You've got your... Oh, boy. A uh, couple tiny edgers here. You can see the... Goodbye. That's going to be fun one to retrieve. Oh, there it is. Good. I should probably put those punches away. Yeah, tiny little edgers. You can see in here for rolling the edges. Uh, this is a marking, I believe, for stitching. It makes a series of holes along the edge, which you can then follow with a needle. Hey, look, it's an awl. A tiny little awl. Ooh. And you'd use that for poking holes for the sewing itself. Neat. Uh, slightly larger edgers. A, uh, an edge burnisher, more markers, more edgers. I'm not sure what this leather finger thing is for. I think it's for rubbing. Oh, that probably like massaging marks. Probably. Anyway, came with two of them. A uh, couple other things in the kit came with, it came with the rotary cutter as well. Mm -hmm which you can use, or you can just use a standard utility knife. Another edger. And this piece here, which is the, uh, that little edge gouger that uh, makes the nice edges. Okay. For the, the channels. I don't know what the word for that is. And then the other piece, the, this sewing all I purchased earlier. And yeah, you Neat. barely need half of that to actually do leather work for things like wallets it's my my impression is that part of the thing is that uh, just be the nature of the material you're working with uh being kind of stiff and the uh, sort of requiring a fair amount of force is that it's difficult to make adjustable tools mm -hmm. and so you sort of have to you have to have like a whole different tool for each size and that kind of mm. thing, rather, rather than like, you know, uh, whatever, a screwdriver that has 20 different ends on it. Yeah, bit, replaceable bit screwdriver type thing. I guess it's, it's probably easier to think of in terms of woodworking in that sense. Like you'd, uh, you don't have uh, replaceable bit chisels because different chisels are you know, different sizes are diff used for different purposes. Mm. That's weirdly. It's interesting that you say it's a stiff uh, ma uh, material to work with, Paul, because it's it is in itself so soft mm. and so uh, so accepting of tooling marks. Like I think I'm just gonna try it here. See how much far I get. I'm pretty sure I can push my way through here. Just wiggling down. Harder to do with a, a multi, multiple piece one, but just to give you an example here, on a single hole where you can get a lot more force behind it, that just goes right through with no problem. 
Like I think I could probably even do that with a fingertip. Okay, so it's a little bit harder than the fingertip, hmm. but it's not much. And of course, if you were using a slightly higher quality, better sharpened version of this rather than the Chinese uh, pot metal ones that I purchased off eBay, mm -hmm. then you're probably going to have an even easier time. I, I mean, I guess that makes sense if you think about, you know, I, how easy it is to say stab someone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. We aren't very, we aren't cured, right? <laughs> Okay, so an interesting thing that I'm noting here is that uh, the holes, and this is the sort of thing we learn as we go on, the holes on the back are not necessarily lining up with the channel. Hmm. Things I will, which is probably why I'd want to uh, put that channel in after the fact next time. All right. But nothing we can do about it this time. The, the channel's already there. We can't exactly un- channel it. But I do want to make sure that those get through far enough to make sewing less of a problem. Whew. So we're coming up to the corner and this is going to be a fun part. Not that smacking things with a hammer isn't fun. Okay. So, here's a question. Do I want to come in it from the other angle? Maybe I do. Nope, maybe I don't. Let's keep the, the front, because the front is going to be shown front towards enemy. No, I think we're good. We're coming from the one side. How many t-shirts are there with that? <laughs> front towards enemy? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, if there aren't enough, mm. we need uh, better. We need to have a market there. Binky is Austin, two British blokes taking a mini GT4 and giving it the four-wheel drive turbocharged engine gearbox running gear from a Toyota Celica ST185 GT4. That sounds like fun. Hmm. Power. I have looked at electrical conversions for minis as well. And unfortunately, there aren't quite as many of them out there. I, uh, several years ago when I was looking at British bikes, um, the, the one thing that was uh, very common was that the electrical systems are shit. <laughs> Just shit. And if you go into that knowing that, then that's fine. Uh, but is it similar for British cars? Not that I've heard of. Okay. People don't tend to complain about the mini electrical system as far as I've been able to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I can guarantee you that, yes, the electrical systems, what is it? It's, it's the weirdest voltage on my bike. I think it's six volts. That is very peculiar. Yeah. Six volts and a magneto system for actually running the electrics. Hmm. So it has a battery, but it's only there for the light. Right. For actual explosions in engine, just simply use the magneto. Hmm. If the engine's turning, it's making electricity. All right, I'm switching over to the... Well, good, I can get one more here with the four in, and then I'm going to switch over to the double to maintain my spacing and go around this corner. All right, let's check things on the bottom. They look good. All right. Follow that edge. That's one. Okay. 
being the corner of the bag, I'm worried this is probably one of the places where it's going to take the most stress. I want to make sure I'm giving uh, it as much love as I can. Considering how long I've had my briefcase for, mm -hmm. would you want to look at that at all to see wear points? Oh, uh, I mean, perhaps. I'm very pleased with how, how your uh, bag has been wearing over time. Yeah, it's so schlumpy now, yep. <laughs> right? Like you just put it down and it's like, well. And I've been wondering about if that's due to the uh, the frequency with which you uh, treat it. Yeah, well, I mean, every few weeks, really. Okay, yeah, then that might be the case. Whenever I notice that, you know, water isn't beating. Right. Um, I, should, I should probably be treating mine a little bit, bit more often then, I think. Mm. I, I mean, I might be overdoing it, I don't know. I mean, it's it seems to be working fine for, for your bag. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've noticed some of mine areas getting a little bit dry. Mm. But overall, I think mm. it's, yeah, it's, it's about due for one now. We can start to see a bit of the movement there. My main wear is the push up in the corner. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got, um, I've actually got a couple of burst seams on mine. Oh that I need to probably take it into Vlad for. Well, I could also give you some uh, some waxed hmm. waxed cord and some needles if you want to take that on as a project for yourself. I, it could be fun, but <laughs> I really... Yeah, it's for something that... I goes. can barely feed myself. <laughs> As Chad says, uh, you know, all of us become a little schlumpy with age. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's just how it's supposed to be. I like to think that my bag and myself are both uh, looking to be roughly the same consistency as um, uh, uh, the butter that you put into to, to cookies around this time of year. <laughs> right. Just left out on the countertop for two hours. Yeah. It there's a, a great documentary I saw about, or, or a sort of YouTube thing about uh, repairing or uh, working, the people who work on uh, Trigger, Willie Nelson's guitar. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, which is basically constantly on the verge of falling up, completely falling apart. Oh, no. But he refuses to get a new one because hmm. he likes the, he likes the sound of it, uh, especially the, the sound of the double... Uh, uh, sound holes, by which you mean that there's the main hole in it, and then there's the one uh, below. The it. one that's worn in yeah. over time. That's just that's just a hole that's happened from his hand. Hmm. Just how he oh. how he rests his hand on it and play because he doesn't play with the pick. Right, right, right. So it's just from his fingernails. Huh. Wow. Over time, and so they have to they're per, they have to preserve it so it doesn't fall apart. But, but not restoring but it. Also, not make it. Not fix it. Yeah. <laughs> Do not fix Willie's guitar. So he's he's saying that, uh, yeah, he'll he's he's adamant that he'll he will keep it going. He will keep it until until he retires. Hmm. Or at which, in if it you know that will be the indication that he needs to retire is that the trigger falls apart. Trigger fails. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. That is indeed what I'm feeling too. Keep going until your trigger falls apart. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm See, currently... I think you know, these are all fitting together kind of nicely. They look... They, they all look of the same... Mm -hmm. Same place. They, they, they've come from the same place. Yeah. Which is... I guess what you want when they're all... I mean, in in reality, mm -hmm. uh, no adventuring group is that color coordinated. <laughs> no, <laughs> they're all going to be wearing like weird mismatched armor that they've stolen off various monsters. Uh, okay. Speaking of adventuring groups, I was watching Star Trek: Deep Space Nine on Netflix last night, and I watched the episode "Little Green Men," mm -hmm. wherein oh, the Ferengi yes. go back, like uh, Rom, Nog, and Quark are sent back in time to 19... Roswell. Yeah, to Roswell, New Mexico in the 1940s. Yep. Um, and they're captured as aliens. 
and there's at one point where there's one point where uh, Quark is trying to convince all the Americans that he represents, you know, the the Ferengi Empire yeah. and that they want to sell them stuff and all they need is all their gold, um, and it's it falls apart. The Americans are like, oh, we don't know about this, and then it comes apart in exactly the same way that every adventuring group has come apart that I've ever been a part of when confronted with adversity. Because they all just like go, start telling wildly different stories over one another. Uh, and then they actually look at a, one another at one point and are like, oh, okay, no, we're going to go with his story. <laughs> right? Let's, let's roll it back. Okay. What and he we'll said. Go, yeah, what he said. Um, and I'm like, I've had this exact experience. <laughs> oh, Star Trek. Pretending that capitalism is bad, <laughs> or at least not desired by governments. Hmm. Okay, so I just need to do his loincloth and waist wrap, and I'm going to paint those black, because, I mean, look at this crew. <laughs> They're going to do great. Mm -hmm. Um... Work on some of the Blackstone Fortress models. Uh, I would need to get a copy of Blackstone Fortress. <laughs> it looks kind of neat. I, I I heard about it and I'm like, wait, Warhammer Quest as 40k? But Warhammer Quest is fantasy. And my brain is like, yes, Cameron, they can do other things with their property. And I'm like, well, that's a good point, brain. Uh, let's look at these screenshots. And I'm like, that looks neat. <laughs> neat. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was like... Neat. <laughs> All right. We have a bit of a problem, but I'm going to declare it not a problem. Ah. In that uh, this side of the bag has become unadhered to itself. Oh, dear. That's fine. The purpose of the, uh, the purpose of gluing it down is just to... Hold it together while you sew? No, hold it together while I make the, the holes for the mm. needle and to make things easier while I sew. But now that we've got the majority of it together it should be okay that's a bad thing to happen or at least an inconvenient thing to happen my black paint has finally failed on me oh no that is extremely inconvenient at this stage yeah i mean it's <sighs> let's see if we can excavate something Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. Mm. <laughs> hmm? I, I like that, that it looks like it's a lot smaller container of paint than it actually is. Oh yeah. Of the, the ring of black oh, on yeah. the inside. <laughs> yeah. Don't do this with your knives. By the way. I'm just going to stab blindly into this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Who knows what there find. we go. There we go. Is there a pocket of deliciousness in there? Well, first off, if you ever put your knife into a, um, into a pot of paint and it comes out looking like this... You have no paint left. Yeah, you have no paint left. If it comes out cleaner than when you put it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You will not. Like that's that. That's not a great sign. Um, you will not go to space today. What is that from? Oh, I can't remember because I remember it was a big. It was a meme for a while. Yeah, you are not going to space today. And then recently, I, I saw it uh, brought up in a uh, discussion of uh, mis soldering something. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you, you will not finish your project. You will not do this, and you will not go to space today. Uh, people are saying that comes from XKCD's Upgoer 5. Explainer. Oh. Oh, okay. Right, that was the ex explaining how a rocket ship goes mm -hmm. using uh, uh, using the, like, only the thousand most common words in the lang English language. Or whatever. Yeah. I also really liked his article at the beginning, of the, or his forward to that book, where he's like, if you were to do a frequency count on the English language, these would not be, you would find that I've used, like, the 5,000 most common. Uh, and I've exercised some editorial uh, control here because I don't need to consider 
it, its, and its uh, three separate words, right? Like, that's a that's a it's a good editorial choice. Yeah. Sometimes it's more important to be accurate, and sometimes it's important to just do well. Mm -hmm. All right, we're just about done with loud times. For this round. There we go. I found a I found a uh, a pustule of uh, usable paint in here. It should be enough to get you through to the end. Yeah. <laughs> Starts yeah, if it starts pointing towards space, you are having a bad problem, and you will not go to space today. <laughs> God, those engines. Are they still the largest uh, rocket engines ever made? I believe they are still the largest. I do not know for certain if they are still the most powerful. Because I remember the space launch system was supposed to be bigger, but that never got built, did it? Mm. I can't remember. That's been, it's been so much flux that it's hard to remember. Especially with Musk changing his mind every two days about what he wants his big rockets to be. Mm. Wasn't there a thing just recently where they lost the Tesla that they fired into space? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> That, That's... like, where it's not where it's, like, it's obviously very hard to track, <clears throat> but it's not where it theoretically should be. That's I mean... not a great sign uh... for an object in the solar system. <laughs> well, there's that, and there's the issues with Onomura, the asteroid that oh, yeah, went yeah. through recently. The... Well, there was that, um, that paper that was going around where a yeah. couple of people at MIT were like, it's an alien spaceship, and everyone who actually does any work with space was like, no, you idiots. It's not an alien spaceship. It is curious what's going on, but... Yeah. It's weird. It doesn't need to be aliens. It's like that, uh, that, uh, what was it, a few years ago where the, um, there was a star that had kind of like a randomly shifting brightness. Oh, yeah. And people were like... It's the ruins of a Dyson sphere in orbit around it, and all the astronomers were like, "Wait, what? That would be nice." But... Yeah, that that uh, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> Do you know something we don't? I'm actually kind of happy though that the discourse I, I've been seeing amongst a lot of sci-fi nerds. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say sci-fi nerds, not scientists. Is it seems that the the current arc is that yeah. If we look at the idea of science fiction of there being old ones in the universe, mm -hmm. maybe we're it at this point. Yeah, I maybe, mean, maybe we are the ones who have to set things up. Yeah, I got bad news for the galaxy. Yeah. We're idiots. Well, at least I am. No, no, we we definitely are as a whole and individually. Good to know. What am I doing here? I'm hammering forks through the skin of a dead animal. I'm painting an imaginary dwarf's ass. <laughs> Deep knowledge about the fundamental understanding of the universe. Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-25 was used on the shuttle. The RS-25D is the most efficient liquid fuel rocket engine currently in use, according to Wikipedia and according to... Omdor Asterix. So, hmm. interesting. The, R the RD-170 is more powerful than the F-1, but the F-1 is still the largest single chamber engine, so there is your answer. Okay. The answer is, kind of? <laughs> Bigger doesn't always mean faster. Hmm. I was impressed by that, uh, oh god, the ion drive model plane that people have been passing around on the news lately. I have not heard those words used together. It was, it's a model plane. They keep, they keep talking about it as a, uh, it's a plane with no moving parts, but still produces thrust. And, well, okay. It's a tiny model plane that's incredibly light, and un, but it is based off of, I believe, an ion drive. Neat. Yeah. It's exciting. You know, new stuff.
the sort of thing that would probably work well attached to a dirigible. Hmm. Dirigible. Ah. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the sun is a third generation star. Yeah, I so, said that early? Yeah. Yeah. Oof. We haven't been at this for very long. Then this yeah. being matter. Um, Fuck, then yeah, we might as well be the first ones. There's a lot of matter recycling left to do. Mm. All right. So that's that. I think what I'm going to do then is I'm going to start sewing from the side that's come apart. So the, the idea is that there's another another panel that's going to go on that. Day. Correct. So what we're looking at here, yeah. So let's give a breakdown of what's going on. This is the inside of the front. So this will be facing away. Thanks. <laughs> this will be facing away from my body as I hang it there. And then this back, this open side, that back flap will come up and go over and connect on this side. Mm. Okay. Disappointed in that glue. It doesn't seem to really have... Well, I mean, it's, uh, it did its, did its job most of the way. I mean, if, you, you, if you hit it, you, you can get a bit of... Uh, a bit of adhesion back. It did its job, hits with hammer. <laughs> Sounds like many of the places I've worked. Oof. You did your job, then were hit by hammer? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> Thank you for completing your task. You're fired. Oh, okay. Can Good I, job. Can I come back? You're perfect. Your job is perfect. In the, in the grammatical sense. <laughs> Perfect in the sense of that it is done, and we no longer want to pay you for your for your time. Mm -hmm. All right, so now I need to measure out roughly two and a half times this length. That's one. I'm gonna go with three. Times to be honest, just to be on the safe side. That's two. Boy, did I estimate this almost perfectly? Coming around to numero. Oh, boy, that feels good. Nice. Like, estimated right down to the amount of slack I would need to go from there to there. Nice, Ian. Nicely done. Feels good. Thank you. That's a knife. Knives can be round, too. All right, let's get that away. I get out my blunt leather sewing needles. You got me excited. <laughs> I do like this idea of, of humans being the precursors. Is there like a, I feel like that's the ripe for some sort of short story or something. I'm certain that Niven or someone must have. It feels like that, that feels like a Niven story, to be honest. Hmm. And it's almost Lovecraftian, mm. right? I'd assume there's some kind of cosmic horror story to do with that. <laughs> I like the idea, yeah, like Revelation, like in, you know, Halo or something, where you finally, you finally meet the precursors and they're like, oh, thank God. Okay, so we've just been like building these big rings, but we don't know what we're doing. Like, there's got to be a better way of doing this. <laughs> yeah, could you help us out a bit? You, you got any ideas? Why are you asking us? It's like, well, you're the precursors. You modified all structure or all, all planets in the galaxy to be hospitable to your kind of weird ass double helix based life. So what are you going to do with it? 
that was the one thing that Prometheus did well that I really enjoyed, which was uh, life, TM, an engineer technology. There actually is a great short story I read about a, uh, a guy who, who he goes off uh, on a, like a hyperdrive ship and he to, to his own he he's he doesn't like people and so he just goes off to a uh, uninhabited but but habitable planet mm -hmm. and just like sets up his own sort of uh uh place to live there uh and he's there for a few years and a generation ship oh that left earth like 200 years earlier shows up oh, no. <laughs> and assumes that he is the native inhabitants of this planet who has somehow taken on uh, human-like characteristics as some sort of cargo cult <laughs> <laughs> and refused to believe him when he explains about how technology has advanced since they left Earth. It's like, not only do you uh, wind up in a place that's going to be inhabited, but you wind up in a place that's going to be inhabited by incredibly stupid people. <laughs> We're helping. Sure. Sure you are. All right. How many circles around do you think this is worth doing to just really secure that end? Hmm. You know, I think, I think this guy's playable. I think this guy's tabletop playable. Very cool. Blah. Ah. I like oh, him. Lottie. That's that's all he says. Ah, oh, Lottie. He took Scottish in high school. Yeah. I, I'm imagining that he's he's barefoot because. He's actually constantly in the state of being interrupted while he's having a shower. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like, ah, I'm trying. Ah, okay, fine. Let's go on an adventure. <laughs> Doing their hair was supposed to take a long time. They had to use bare fat until it just kind of stayed like this eventually. Oh, no. Okay. And I guess the lowest ranked tier of Slayer was Bear Slayer. Although, seeing in the instruction manual, this guy is called a fire slayer, so I see that the dwarves actually just went right for, like, the thing that they absolutely couldn't hit with an axe. Heat? Wait, wait, wait. These idiots are going against things that can die. What if I just throw myself into a fire? Doesn't that seem like cheating? That's genius. I'm a wood chipper slayer. <laughs> I'm a West Hastings player. I'm a cold vacuum of space slayer. Ooh. Okay. Hello, entropy. All right. I think I like this guy. I think I like him. Yeah. I really need to make a. a pony for stitching. Well, I guess this is okay. I mean, I want this guy to look like he smells like beef jerky. Oh, oh wait, I need to do his loincloth. I said that. Well, I mean, a loincloth made of beef jerky would definitely fit the bill. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm a diabetes type 2 slayer. You're just having a slurpee. It was supposed to be like a leather loincloth, but he didn't like tan it properly, and so it just became beef jerky over time. <laughs> it wasn't tanning, it was seasoning salt. It's a field ration. Uh oh. Mm, tastes like last week. Oh, no. 
I made a boo-boo. Uh-oh. Yup. And hopefully I will not cause too much of a problem undoing it. No boo-boo. No uh-oh. Fix the uh-oh. Managed to punch through the thread part way down. And that's not a good thing. Okay, whew, got it out. We should be safe now. So is there a special stitch that you're doing, or is it a standard? Standard saddle stitch. And I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure I spoke about this earlier, but what it means is you're just basically going through the same hole. You're doing two stitches, essentially, with the same wire, or same thread. So you're doing the standard back and forth, back and forth, all the way up. Mm hmm and then you're doing the same thing through the same holes on the other side. Oh, okay. Essentially, you go through the same hole, pull, do the same thing. Okay. And that way, you end up with a stronger stitch so that if one side of the stitching fails, the other side remains intact. Makes sense. It's just very time-consuming. but it looks lovely and actually this one is starting to look very good too right. so i think after today i'll probably end up finishing this uh finishing the stitching for this off camera Okay. Because this can just end not, up taking a long time and it's not, not visually interesting. interesting. Exactly. Mm. That said, I will probably also end up gluing the gluing and putting on maybe even stitching the other side as well. Mm. Because the flap is ready to go. It's already been cut out. But I do want to bring this back on air to do the hardware. That's something that I have been told by Corvus and others. And thank you, Corvus, for throwing that uh, that diagram of the saddle stitch in the chat. That's, oh. It's a perfectly good explanation of how it, it works and why it's as good as it is. Sewing machine stitches end up being almost disastrous. And when you're dealing with leather where you need that strength, you know, because you're either carrying things inside a bag or riding the damn thing on top of a horse. Mm -hmm. you or need maybe you're it... getting hit hard. Right. Yeah. You, you want it to stay in one piece. And you want an assurance that it will remain intact. Mm -hmm. What, what is a pony in the context of leather working? I may be getting the word incorrect, but a... a Stitching pony is a device that it's just two pieces of, of wood that come together in a clamp, sort of like two hand, my hands are right now, to hold the stitching in a place that's easier with the hands. Uh, oh, so kind of like a vice in a yeah. metal shop or a wood shop. A, yeah, Corvus has an image in the... Oh, uh, okay. And you use wood there because it's a softer material and mm. you have less chance of marking it. Sometimes you'll... Oftentimes people will build these themselves and you'll put, you know, leather pads on the insides of the the tongs. It's just one of those things I haven't had time to put together yet. Oh, that was a mistake too. That's okay. Happy little accidents. Mm. Just turn it into a tree. It's fine. Just turn it into a tree. Turn it into a newt. is that I want to undo the stitch without sewing it through the fabric. Uh-oh. What have I done? My Swedish friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Johnny Cash o'clock. 
What the hell have I done? there but how the rabbit goes through the hole around the tree okay so that's connected to that <sighs> all right Oh. Oh, I think I've, I think I managed to find a double hole. So yeah, let's all have a look here. See if we can zoom in right there. So that's the hole that I think I've managed to find an internal hole because if you look on the back side. There's nothing connected in there. So let's just try pulling that out as it is. Oopsie. Yeah, big old oopsie here. Is that the fork? The fork didn't go quite all the way through? No, I think it's that I... Uh, I, I made a new hole on the back side somehow. Hmm. Well. Uh oh. Now I'm getting tangled. Uh oh. Yeah, this is this is disastrous if it ends up wrong. But okay. Can you always just cut and pull the stitches? Oh yeah, that's that's possible, and I think that's actually just what's gonna happen here. Hmm. I mean, this is your first time trying this, right? Well, to this extent. And with this level of, I want to say, skill and uh, expectation. Really. Sounds like a fine time to make a mistake. Yep. Best to be a mistake and not an error. Is that the way they go? Hmm. Uh, that... that might have just been a Star Trek or a Star Wars thing, where Grand Admiral Thrawn kills a guy <laughs> in on the, um, or orders the execution of one of his crew members, and asks the captain, "Do you know what the difference is between an error and a mistake?" Mistake is an error you haven't corrected, or you refuse to correct. Begin training as replacement. Something like that. Hmm. Mistake and error you haven't it, it might have been an error is a mistake you haven't corrected. I don't know. There was a particular particu a peculiarity to it. That's an interesting aphorism. I'm, I'm trying to internalize... I feel like getting that wrong would mm -hmm. itself be grounds for shooting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is a tricky thing. Yeah, like, come on, Thrawn, get this right. Everyone's watching you. <laughs> Quite literally, that's the whole point of this show, isn't it? Yeah. That direction. Okay, good. So this thing's gonna go that way. Back at it again. There we go. Now we're in business. See, I guess Thrawn is canon now that he's been in. Oh, Rebels? Rebels? Yeah. Or, or back to can't. Well, I mean, primary canon now, I guess? I guess I so. Don't... Like, didn't Star Wars have that weird grading system for its canonicity? Oh, yes, with, yeah, level, the, the, the whole George level yeah. being the top. Which I appreciate as somebody who, who makes things where mm. George Lucas just said, sure, whatever they want to pay me for is canon until it like, contradicts something in the, one of my movies. In which until case, I say it contradicts it. <laughs> yeah, in which case it dies. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. Yep. It's it's your baby, George. Yep. Then you sold it. Just the idea of canon tell is something I have a 
complex relation to, I guess? Yeah, because I mean, it's it's fundament it's well, it's about legitimacy, yeah. right? The nerd in me loves it because it's it's classification, right? Mm -hmm. I can now point this to this and say yes, this is true or this is false. Yeah. In a fictional setting. But I mean also, is it just like an enjoyable story? Sure, then it still exists. Yeah, yeah G Cannon sounds like something from Gundam. <laughs> I also, believe... I've been watching uh, on Netflix, they have one Gundam series, which is Gundam Universal Century. Really? Yeah, uh, with the Unicorn Gundam. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, no, this is actually not bad. I've watched some stinky Gundam in my time, and this one is, it's, it's not bad. Gundam Unicorn is, which is the Herschel name for that particular one, mm -hmm. is uh, actually one of, my, one of my favorites. I really enjoyed it as films, hmm. I think more than as a series. I, I looked it up on Wikipedia, and the... Um, they they apparently for for Netflix they they had a document for the audiences that was like if this is your first Gundam series, a lot of primary characters are going to die. Yep. And you know won't necessarily know they've died until they get back to base and are like, what happened to that guy? Oh, he exploded. It's important that you know that this person, it, who seems very important, is a clone, but a different type of clone than this other person. Mm-hmm. This is what a new type is. Don't worry, it won't matter. They'll have a depleted uranium round put through their head at some yeah. point. <laughs> but it's important to note that the, the creation of new types is a very sad thing, TM. Hmm. And that's, that's, that's actually a good series to start with, given that uh, Bandai is now... They, they've discovered, hey, guess what? All those old nerds who like Universal Century, mm -hmm. they've gotten even older, and, and now they have money. money. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna make all of our Universal Century projects the passion projects, mm. like prestige projects. Ah. So it's never been a better time to be a fan of the Universal Century. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, it was Gundam UC, which I always like. Oh, Gundam Universal Century, but it's Gundam Unif Unicorn. Something. This is a unicorn. Yeah. The, the next one that's coming is Gundam NT. Mm -hmm which normally you would think would stand for new technology or something like that. They're saying, though, that's, that stands for narrative now. And that's the name of the Gundam, not the concept oh, of okay. a Gundam narrative. Like, I mean, like, the snarky answer is like, oh, so this one has a story. <laughs> um. Wait, they named it Gundam Narrative? Yep. Gundam Narrative. It's a test bed for the Unicorn platform that may or may not have a psycho frame. Ooh. What do these words mean? Not much, but... means they're more powerful. <laughs> I mean, it, it means they have certain levels of plot armor. Yeah. Certain canonical levels of plot armor. <laughs> Ooh. Or certain canonical levels of bullshit. Gundam NT Speaking, hit yeah, Japanese I mean, theaters today. Good. Speaking of canon. <laughs> one of my favorite parts about uh, Unicorn was just the name that they gave, that uh, one of the main characters picked for themselves as an alias. Oh, Audrey Byrne. Oh yeah. yeah. All right, we're making good progress on stitches now. <laughs> yeah, so it's a good, also a good time to just be a general anime fan mm. <laughs> with a Netflix subscription specifically. I mean, for the longest time, Netflix was just like the uh, the Darmok button, <laughs> right? I've got 40 minutes. What can I do? I can fire up Darmok. Ooh. Just watch Darmok. Why haven't I considered doing that before? Yeah. You got 40 minutes? Just watch Darmok. Are they, do they have the HD? Uh, yeah, they do. They do. Hello. And you say they've got all of DS9, which I know is not... Yeah, DS9, uh, I've read they're having a lot of problems with the idea of doing an HD of it, because they switched from uh, models, mm -hmm. which they used in the early series, to doing CG, because they could just get all the models from um, First Contact. Yeah, and some of the, some of the production teams did do things in high definition. Mm -hmm. because... And some of them did not. Yep. And the stuff that did not would require a complete, like you can't just up, up sample it. 
you would have to completely rebuild it, apparently. And the problem is, I'm sure if they ask the fan, if, if this was something they could ask the fans for, mm -hmm. they probably already have all the necessary assets. Mm -hmm. Sci-fi fans kind of are that way, which is great. It just means that, you know, you, you have to figure out, you have to get, be made aware of the projects that the fans make before they get shut down. Yeah. I was seeing today there was a lovely uh, in the Unreal Engine uh, group is making a I want to say a recreation of the Titanic. Oh, neat! And I was thinking, wow, this is just like the ones they that they've done of the Enterprise in the past. Hmm. Except this one one won't get shut down because no one owns the the copyright to the Titanic. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Titanic doesn't have phaser banks <laughs> or a shuttle bay. Mm -hmm. I like that that uh, rendered walkthrough of the the Enterprise, just for like the, um, you know, it had all the different lounges. Yes. Right, because ten forward wasn't the only lounge on the on the Enterprise. Right, there was like eleven forward and eleven port. Yeah. Right, and like a few other non gynan hosted. Yeah, but like if you just wanted to sl sit down somewhere and like work on something in a place that wasn't your quarters or your workstation. <laughs> Then you could go to any of the any of the lounges, and I also really enjoyed the um, the intramural sports team logos mm. that were on the shuttle bay. I didn't see floors. those. Oh. There was like the starboard sharks, <laughs> and like some other like there were like three or four different intr intramural space ball leagues. I love it. Right. <laughs> I thought that was a neat addition, right? Because of course the. Yeah, of course there's probably organized sports on the Enterprise. So. And, and of course they'd probably play them in the, uh, in the, in the, the shuttle, shuttle bay. bay. Yeah, because it's a big open area. And the holodeck's not big enough to get a full team in, I guess. Like Although wanna... I think they've fudged that a few times. Yeah. yeah. But if you want a rugby team, that's probably not going to go in the holodeck. God, do you think that, that ships, bars get reputations? Amongst, uh, yeah, um, amongst, I mean, there's the there's definitely going to be at least like the, the good bar, yeah, and the not good bar. But I mean, like amongst amongst ships themselves, like, do you think people say like, boy, I just want to, I want to make sure to time my leave just right so I can take the Enterprise to Risa because ten four is kicking. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, the Pegasus has the best dive bar. If you just want to get stinky. So the, the idea that like the bar actually has a reputation separate from the ship itself. Exactly. Because mm. I'm sure, yeah, you get you get variations within the bars on the one ship, but. Yeah, I mean, like the holodeck is large enough uh, to to contain an entire plot, <laughs> right? It's as large as it needs to be, yeah. to do whatever you want. I hope that's the sort of... The Pegasus' dive bar really rocks. Boo! <laughs> I hope that's the sort of thing we get more of in... more explored in the uh, the coming Upper deck series. Mm. Sorry, Lower Decks series. <laughs> it was like, a, really? They've just gone, uh, huh, really giving the fans what they want, I guess. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which fans necessarily want to watch. Is Troy in it? Um... <laughs> We've shown you every part of the Star Trek universe, from the hot shores of Vulcan all the way to the lush forests of Ryza. But there's one part that you haven't seen. The commode. Sure. Welcome to Upper Decks. How do people shit in Star Trek? The answer might right. surprise you. Well, you think Picard is always like adjusting his uniform when he stands up. Space I haven't pooped in four years. Diapers. Yeah, you can just hear everyone's colostomy bag sloshing whenever the uh, they get struck by phasers. Which is why everyone dislikes data. Mm. Motherfucker, the android doesn't have a bag. It's not fair. And that's why anything bad can happen to O'Brien, because he just teleports his poop right out of them. Yep. 
and you know he needs a karmic comeuppance for that. Oh God, that's why he was so pissed off. Is that the is that his his child was born during a uh, during a transporter outage? Oh yeah, because so, they would have just beamed the kid right out of it, Keiko, right? Oh, the hell he would have, yeah. Like you're the transporter chief, you can just solve a lot of your problems by being unprofessional. <laughs> There was probably a webcomic about this, wasn't there? Can't use the computer for personal... Can't use Starfleet equipment for personal work? Pfft. Like I'm he, the chief. Like Fine, he, I'll just bill for this thing. Like, he definitely doesn't walk into work in the morning. Oh, God. Computer, I'm feeling extensively lazy. Please just beam three pounds of hamburger meat directly into my stomach. <laughs> Hold still. All right. I can never tell whether you're. Oh, talking to the. Yeah. Sorry. No. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> not the. Com not me. The computer. Mm-hmm. Oh, there was a Chief O'Brien at work comic. Right. Oh. Okay. Was it any good? <laughs> I mean, it's cold me, so it has to be okay. Mm. Oh, now I can't remember who it was that's... I'm going to say Peter Jackson, because I'm pretty sure he dealt, deals with this. But I saw a trailer today for a film that's being released this uh, December. Mm -hmm. 17th and 20th, I believe, are going to be showings in the States, at least, and I couldn't find any evidence of screenings in Canada. Mm -hmm. But it is, they're using the Weta uh, technologies for reconstructing film. From the First World War? Yes. Yeah, uh, they will not grow old, yes, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to see that. That looks fascinating. Or they shall not grow old? It's from Flanders Fields, right? The yes. title. Not from, uh, not from Cocoon. Never get old, I'll never die. Wilford Brimley was not old in that. No, I mean, the, the, the trivia that always gets passed around is that Wilford Brimley was the same age in Cocoon as Tom Cruise was in the previous Mission Impossible movie. Oh. The one where he hung off the side of the plane. Wow. Wilford Brimley has just always looked like that. I mean, he's got to take good care of himself. He's... I mean, I guess you don't advance to Wilford Brimley age and just stay there for 50 years by not taking care of yourself. Well, I mean, he's, he's living with diabetes. So he's taking care of himself. I mean, I almost him. asked if he, if he was, but I assume that Wilford Brimley is of the firmly ethical type who would not I would take that so. paycheck. <laughs> At least he's not one of the catheter salesmen hmm. on the news programs. I don't actually watch cable news. I just believe John Oliver when he tells me that they're full of ads for catheters. I, uh, well, that'll keep me away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think three times the thread was enough for this. Hmm. Peter Falk was 41 in Columbo? <laughs> what? Because he looked 70. Yeah. Did that man smoke a pack of cigarettes from age three each day? Or was he just brined in whiskey? <laughs> uh, would I recommend any kit to get someone started on their own mini painting? Go on your local Craigslist. <laughs> This is what, this used to work, actually. Go on your local Craigslist, and if you want Games Workshop minis to paint, look for somebody who's selling the other half of their starter set. Huh. I don't know, probably about 20 bucks. It used I'll, to be like 20 bucks to get the other half of the starter set. I laugh, but that sounds 
Yeah. Really? Because it used to be tradition that you would get the starter set and you would get the rule books and the templates and the dice and the whippy sticks. <laughs> And then you would only want one of the one of the starter sets, or maybe neither of them, mm -hmm. right? Maybe you weren't into playing Space Marines and Dark Eldar, right? Um, so you just use those to uh, defray the cost okay. of getting into the hobby. Oh, okay. So it's not even a case of someone just noping right out. It's just that they have excess. Yeah. Interesting. Because uh, the starter sets come with two armies to play against one another. Huh. Um, it's sort of like uh, magic cards, you know. Mm -hmm. There's often people around who have a bunch of stuff that they don't really want anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I've said before that uh, in terms of uh, source of models, that's the reason why I have uh, two, com two mostly complete sets of Hero Quest. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, it was, or they were, it was originally bought for uh, because I was uh, trying to paint stuff and. Uh, it was just a nice source of models. Yeah. Well, like that Hero Quest box site used to be a really good source of um, plastic mummies back when in, what was it, 5th edition, 4th and 5th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battles? Mummies were like a really good unit for the Undead Army, but they were only available in pewter. Ooh. So they were quite expensive. But if you could get those, those were real cheap. Hmm. Uh, also, I think the zombies for a long time were not available in plastic. You get skeletons, but skeletons were... Sometimes you just wanted the meat block of a, of a <laughs> zombie regiment. And of course, the Chaos Warriors. Mm, mighty Chaos Warriors. Okay, so tell me of these whippy sticks. A whippy stick was because uh, they wanted to include everything you needed to get started in the hobby, uh, but couldn't include, like, a tape measure, because a tape measure was too expensive. But they did have the ability to just make plastic stuff. Huh. So you would, got, you would get... I think they were 18 inches long, but they were a red plastic... 18 inch long stick with one inch markers along it. Oh, okay. And they were just a little flexible, so you immediately took them out and just, bop, bop, bop. yeah, beat the shit out of each other with right. them, right? Until you had welts on your forearm. Um, ah, nice. good times. <laughs> All right. Well, I am going to suggest that I think now seems like a good time for us to take a short break. Sounds good. Because uh, I'm just about done with my stitching here, and I'm going to say that we've. Let's do. Let's yep. take. A there second. they are, Corvus. That's the ones. Let's take a second to appreciate. Ooh, yeah, that came out pretty good. It's not all in the channel. Okay. Hey, wow, that looks really tidy. Especially yeah. on that side, which I'm, which which will be the showing side on the edge. Mm. I'm very happy with that. It looks like an actual bag. Yeah, unlike with. Uh... Uh, regular sewing when you turn it all inside out to hide all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You gotta make sure you look nice. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like a top stitching on a suit, mm -hmm. right? Like sometimes top stitching is there to look good or give texture. The fun part is when we end up coming back and we're gonna shave down and then sand these edges so they're matching and give it a good burnishing, mm. which is gonna take a hell of a long time, but I think it's gonna be worth it. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. That's very handsome, Ian. Thank you. Good work. Thank you. So, as I said, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with more painting and some soldering. After Ooh. this, don't go away. <clears throat> Welcome back. Tinker Taylor Solder Fry here on the Mighty Loading Ready Run Video Entertainment Network. We are painting minifigs. Yes, from Silver Tower. Yeah, you just finished up. What? The, uh, yeah, the Fire Slayer. Oh, I'm muted, aren't I? <laughs> I just finished up the uh, Dwarven Fire Slayer, mm -hmm. so I think he looks That's pretty cool. Um, incredibly. Like, the, the detail on that is, is a lot, let's be honest. It's fun. Yeah. And I'll, once Matt has it zeroed in, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Matt, I moved it around. I can give it a slight spinning around. I mean, what I'm most impressed with is that the back. Oh, like those yeah. Those are not big. Those are not big. It's, uh, I mean, that's what you wind up spending most of your time looking at as mm -hmm. the player, is the miniature's backs, <laughs> right? Like, so you, you spend all the time on, like, um, you know, in Warhammer Fantasy Battle, you spend a lot of time on, like, their banners, yeah. right, and how they all look, and then you point them away from you, and you're like, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> this part I didn't, I didn't actually work on very hard. But, yeah, so that's fun. Well, that's, I, I, 
I'm mostly amazed with the the, the, the shading on the bits. Oh, that, thank that's you. That's such a difficult... I, I don't know how to do that to begin with, so to be able to see it at that level of, of granularity is just amazing. I appreciate that. I think I'm actually going to paint his toenails. <laughs> get right in there. Yeah, get right in there. <laughs> All right, well, my other project for tonight, I've been kind of working on two. Uh, first off, we're going to be doing an oscilloscope, which is a, uh, well, I'm going to be making an oscilloscope from a kit because I thought, hey, why don't I do some solder together kits? Because I like doing soldering in general and I could use a, uh, an oscilloscope. Mm -hmm. I recently found out they're useful for troubleshooting boards, which will be good because I have a, Ooh. I have a theremin project that I've, put together a long time ago that never quite worked right so right okay with this i can finally you can visualize the uh the I, waveforms i remember simply. you pulling that out at previous desert buses and it making horrible horrible oh, noises you know, you're thinking about the red theremin that one is that one is working as intended <laughs> oh okay <laughs> no the, the other one is a is a kit model that has actually a two-handed operation whereas the red one is more of just a single on off in out but the other project I've been working on uh, tonight that has been less visible, other than, of course, the bag, is the uh, the Rover Mini. And we won! We did it! We got there. Um, <laughs> absolute unit. And it is, in fact, an absolute beautiful unit. There we go. Uh, Paul's got some pictures of it. It's got some uh, modifications to it. You can see up here, normally, normally you'd have a normal uh, Mini badge, but they've replaced it with what appears to be a uh, the British Air Force. Roundel, which oh, I kind really? of love, also yeah. up on yeah, the, the uh, RAF. Yeah, the there we go on the pillar there. And those are the fog lights that don't work. Hmm. Uh, there's a something on the back as well, which I'm looking to remove. Yeah, you can see the Union Jack has been uh, kind of oh etched into the. I, I think it's probably a vinyl sticker of some sort. Oh, you can so get rid I'm of that easily. Feeling that out. Ooh, can I? <laughs> yes, <laughs> if at all possible, I will endeavor to make sure that you can pull that off a yes. few like beatles sticker pink floyd and uh apple music or yeah apple music apple records stickers on the back oh okay oh yes 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 yeah. uh, and then on the interior uh we've got the half leather seats and the uh the nice uh checked pattern of their mm. uh, the mayfair version right this is the other interesting thing because they were made so late into the run into the 90s this has an airbag oh really yeah a mini with an airbag so I'm less likely to die in the of the crash. And and I'm not... It's right-hand drive, of course. Yes, it is, which means I'm going to have to get used to shifting with my left hand, which is going to be interesting. Mm. But is the is the clutch brake <laughs> gas arrangement still in the same order? Yes. Okay. It is still okay. Good. Normal that way. Okay. Because that would that would be killer. And of course, one last bit of note: uh, some aftermarket uh, cranks for the windows and the handles and the door frame, which are just drilled out, hmm. beautiful things. Uh, Nigoki, yes, I have confirmed earlier before I actually got into this that yes, I am in fact able to fit into a Mini. There was one that was for sale in Duncan, mm -hmm. nearby, mm -hmm. nearby to here, and I thought, well, I'm not necessarily going to buy it. And turns out after having looked at it, it was a very good idea that I didn't buy it because it was rusted to heck. Mm. But at least gave me an opportunity to get, in, get inside one, test drive it a bit to see if I like the way they, they feel, and also right. to you know, find out if they fit. Ergonomics are important. And yeah, yeah the, there's a lot of interior space in those cars. It's kind of surprising. Oh. Huh. So yeah, I'm going to get myself a, uh, a fuel-injected classic Mini. Cool. Air bag. I'm so excited. Yeah, this is interesting. Because it's, uh, again, I just have it in the pocket like that. And now we'll just... Put it direct to the side near the top, yeah, and kind of sticking on top out on top of the pocket. Hmm. All right, now let's have a look at what we've got here. This is the DSO fifteen thousand and one K, which purchased from Banggood. Other Chinese drop shippers are available. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah. It's just a nice little digital oscilloscope with big ol' OLED screen. Cool. And uh, thankfully, I... There's two instruction manuals. Okay, good. This is the instruction manual for usage? Or no, this is part two. Good. There are two different uh, 
versions of this kit you can get. There is the hard mode version, and then there is the easy mode version, which I purchased. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by easy mode and hard mode is that it is possible to buy this kit with the boards fully unpopulated, which means no surfaced mount uh, electronics. Surface mount electronics being things like these chips here, mm -hmm. and uh, these tiny, tiny resistors. Oh, so you have to solder them all in? Yeah, exactly. So surface mount meaning things that don't go through holes. Mm. Okay. So easy okay. soldering. This one, they yeah, they do the surface mounting for you. And it is possible to solder them by hand, but I don't like doing it's, that. <laughs> it's so nice these days when, uh, you know, they, they, they have an option for people who just want to experience the story and <laughs> don't want to have to deal with it being so difficult. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I also, I also hecked up on which one I ordered because I was hoping to order one with a more robust uh, probe system. Mm -hmm. But this one came with two alligator clips. They work the same, but I wanted a fancy probe that has little tiny grabby hands. Mm -hmm. But I can, bu I can buy that aftermarket. That's no problem. Because, Modifying something from Banggood. Well, <laughs> well, thankfully, this actually comes with a BNC connector for its oh. probes, which is, from my understanding, pretty standard for good oscilloscopes. Anyway, it comes with a nice case, rotary encoder, box. It's, I think it's going to be a fine little oscilloscope for what it needs to do, which is very light-duty work. Mm -hmm. but yeah, all the parts in a little thing. And we're just going to go about assembling this. So let's let's take stock of our parts here first, because that's going to be important. Uh, so those, that's the SMD parts list. We don't need those because the SMDs have already been been assembled. Um, we need to check the parts on the back here. So check the main board. Before mounting any parts to the main board, connect the 9-volt power supply, center positive to J7 on your board, and check the display. Well, we don't have a 9-volt power supply, so we'll just jump ahead. <laughs> See your scope boots up to a screen similar to the photo below. Okay. First up, we need the test signal terminal. Oh, wow, these are so small. Some of these resistors are just coming right out of the side of the bag. <laughs> Aha. So, we get this little thing here, which is just a little metal terminal, and that's what we're going to use to connect. We're going to use this to test the oscilloscope because this will output, I believe, a set wave just for calibration purposes mm. uh before soldering bend the terminal to the shape as shown in the photo above okay bend things power terminal optional no i think we want we, we, we want the power connector that seems useful uh slide switch check we have it pin header mail we have a pin header. Oh, wait, this is the big thick pin header. Pin header, correct. Switches, tactile switches, times four. One, Ooh. two, ooh, that's good. That's, that's good button feel. Bring that, bring that to the mic. On three, one. Mm -hmm. Two, three. <laughs> on on zero. Okay. Yes. Or three, two, one, zero. Three, two, one. Mm. That's good. Yeah. Oh, that was the hardest part about putting together the button this year for Desert Bus, was getting people to agree on how to press it huh. when it came time to simultaneous presses. Oh, okay. Step seven it was it wants me to remove a resistor from the surface mounting. What? Note R30 is used to bypass SW5 so that the main board can be tested without the power switch. It must be removed for correct functioning of the power switch. Okay. 
So it's there so that you can test the board without having to have the power switch installed. Nice of them. Well, that seems like a good start then. Let's, uh, let, let's start things off with those pieces because that's uh, a very fine place to start, as Maria would say. And we'll put the rest of these tiny bits over here for the moment until we need to come to them. Which one is the right switch? Big thick switch is the one for power. Good. All right, move all this over. So tiny everything. Apparently, the rotary encoder on this can be adapted to other uses. Should you so desire. All right, let's get out the tools. We'll need our soldering iron. Some solder. Tip cleaner. Mm. We might need the multimeter for later, so we'll bring that out. Desoldering braid. Pray that we don't need that. Hmm. Uh, Arclight Dynamo in the chat. It's apparently there's some really sweet vintage Ooh. Uh, oscill oscilloscopes. Well, I did save money on that uh, that car. <laughs> so hey, uh, wow. Oh, neat. Yeah. You can get a vintage CRT scope from RCA. Yeah, that's that's, that's a, pretty cool. That is a beautiful thing. If I had this. If I had that scope, the problem is I would be tempted to just put together a, uh, a hardware version of Pong or better yet, Tennis for Two, one of the first video games to run on the scope and just use it to, hmm. as a display. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find in here. I had flux, but I guess I didn't leave it in. The oh, no, there it is. Uh, I think your uh, microphone has kind of slid down your... Uh the front, of your front again. Yep, there it is. Flip over. Actually, hold on. I just muted you. Uh, it's useful for holding up microphones. There we go. Yeah, I, I remember actually some fairly high profile stuff with um, uh, like uh, alt alternate reality games. Uh, using like, there'll be like a, uh, you know, something will happen. They'll be, it'll like play a sound, and people figured out that if you put that sound through an oscilloscope, it actually like created a picture. Oh no! Oh yeah, I remember that. With um, years and years ago, uh, Nine Inch Nails' Year Zero album. Right. They uh, at the concerts they put a bunch of like thumb drives in the bathrooms, and the thumb drives had an mp3 of one of the songs at it with this horrible noise at the end but if you put the um the noise noise through a uh, you know if you looked at the spectrum yeah, you could see like this hand yeah. all right a spectroscope not an oscilloscope yeah. Yeah, oscilloscope good for looking at waves hmm. yeah, i've always enjoyed those uh hiding images in the spectral mm -hmm. data a Apex Twin that did that with one of the, one of his songs too. Really? Only it was his face, like the <laughs> leering, smiling face. Oh, that face! Yes, that mm -hmm. creepy, creepy one that we see everywhere. Is this you know, person you you're painting too. now, Cam, part of the adventuring party? Yes, I believe so. Ah. So these are just base coats, right? Um, if you're new here, I I use a white primer for this because I like the pop it gives to the colors. I mean, it's largely superstitious, I feel, <laughs> um, because you, you know, you wind up covering everything. But I, you know, I want to say that a white primer gives brighter colors and fundamentally these are, th these, these are our playing pieces and they're, they're very comic book feeling. So I want them to be bright and vivid. Um, you know, if I'm doing like um, a model of a Spitfire, I might prime it black, right? 
Oh, and everybody right. else is just kind of standing, and she's like in the middle of a lunge. Mm. Well, both of the elves are kind of in the middle of lunges, if you'll. Oh, okay, yeah. He's actually like flying. Mm hmm. Nice. All right, so let's heat up our soldering iron. I'm very happy. So yeah, this is uh, for those not uh, following along with the saga. This is the TS-80 uh, portable soldering iron, USB-C powered. And uh, I've been using it for, since previous to Desert Bus, I used it to put together all of the, the buttons. And it's, mm. I'm very happy with it. So you could run it off like uh, an anchor. Yeah. Or off a computer. Well, you you need USB powered to live. Or sorry, it's uh, whatever the the Qualcomm QI version three standard is. Okay. So most computers don't output that much mm. because it needs, I think, twelve watts at least. Or right. Is it, or is it like the those the like the red port on computers? Not quite enough. Or even that. Be yeah, because it is. You, you are putting out some pretty heavy heavy-duty power, but there are certain power bricks that will use this. And no, not USB power delivery. It's uh, QC, the, the Qualcomm fast-charging USB standard. Mm. That's not USB power delivery, which is unfortunate because it looks like everyone's moving to power delivery as their It seems their system. so much more uh, sort of compact than uh, some other soldering irons I've seen. That, that whole station that I've used previously? Yeah. yeah. I guess, I mean, you need still need somewhere to put it, I guess, but yeah. you don't really need the full soldering station. Exactly. So what I need to do is... I still need to make a solder holder. All right, let's push this forward because I'm going to use the edge of the table to hold that thing in place while I get it in there. And let's give it a little bit of flux just to really get that solder to stick. I can't believe I went nearly 40 years of my life without using flux. Mm. It changes the game in terms of how easy it is to solder. Care to elaborate? Well, what the flux does is it's, uh, I believe it's an acid. I can't remember always, but it, it makes, it makes the metal suck the solder to it. Okay. It's, uh, I think what it does is it, it's really just cleaning the metal. Yeah, well, I, I've heard flux removes impurities, and I'm like, that's an interesting statement. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I think it, it's just removing oxidation mm. so that the uh, the solder will will bond. So it's straight metal to metal bonding. Yeah, and okay. it's not trying to get around anywhere. And yeah, you can get some very clean solders there. There we go. Mm. Good stuff. There's some soldering wire that has flux like built into it, right? Well, most solder does. Mm -hmm. But it's generally not enough to always to do to, to, to make it easier to solder. Mm. Like this is technically rosin cord. But it's not enough. Okay, so that's part one. That was easy. Next up, J6, pitched right angle power connector optional. You go in the back of here, I guess. Oh, wow, this is not exactly the best, the most uh, well labeled of circuit boards, shall we say. Mm -hmm. That's ground. I'm pretty sure that it's just these two up here. Oh, no, I was completely wrong. It's at the bottom. Good thing I didn't try to solder up at the top because that would have been the trigger and... Oh, yeah, I was about to solder the power to the section of the motherboard intended for the, uh, the BNC connector. <laughs> Whoops. 
I'm getting a very strong signal here. <laughs> Nine volts, exactly. So we're going to do this up right. We're going to do it up proper. A griffin should be golden, right? Like yellow, like the yellow coat of a of a lion. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think that's if if you're going more more liony griffin than golden would definitely be the case. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm a big fan of the of. of I guess you could call it the bald eagle color scheme of griffins, mm. or the brown and white. But mm. I I'm think imagining that, sort of like a heraldric griffin almost. Yeah, yeah. That because the you uh, definitely want gold. The the cleric character gets a pet. Who's this? Who's a good boy? I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, a little baby griffin. Mm -hmm. Someone asked in the chat oh. if I work with the right size griffin. Mm -hmm. Right, that was good. Wait, in, is it? It is. I'm always worried about putting too much solder on these things, which is something you, know, you really shouldn't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. Okay, switch for power. This one will be fun because it's got three contacts. Where do you go? Right next to the power. But on which side? All right, thankfully that just fits in with friction. I'll just give that a good little painting with the one piece of equipment I need next, I think, for my soldering is a fiberglass pen for roughing up surfaces. <sighs> Remember kids, exhale while soldering over top of fumes. <laughs> Metals are not your friend. They don't want to be in your lungs. Well, no, they very much want to be in your lungs. You do not want them in your lungs. Good, clean board. Good, clean connections. Happy day. I guess the trick is not having any of the solder touch it, each other, right? Yes. All the pins have to be isolated from each other. And we're going to do a... I assume you can count on uh, capillary, capillary Quite a bit. action to do a lot of that for you? Quite a bit. It's one of my favorite physical properties now that I've been doing more, <laughs> more soldering. Properties or... What would you call that? Capillary? Phenomenon? Yeah, phenomenon. I mean, I, I, I know I've, I've seen it, um, people talking about doing, like, for, for especially for surface mount components, it's quite amazing, actually, the way you sort of put the stuff down and then heat it up and it all kind of moves into the right spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is, again, Ideally, assuming would, you know what you're doing. Which is why the, the flux can be so magic, when you can just heat things up and just put... The first time I remember using Flux was for that uh, that job doing the chips on the Dreamcast, mm -hmm. and noticing that yeah, you just put you put Flux down on the chip sides, put down a huge glob of solder, and then just rake your soldering iron across the chips, and the capillary action, along with the uh, the function of the Flux, just sucks the solder right into where it needs to be, making these hmm. perfectly crisp lines between the uh, the legs of the chip. Is there a NASA soldering guide? I know they have a um, splicing oh. guide. Oh yes, mm. yes, and it's it's part of the same same family of products. Okay, I'm just supposed to do. I 
think those might just be sp hmm. yeah but that's that's the center point in the switch so yes those of course would actually connect together anyway because they'd be ground as long as the nothing else is making a connection unless it's supposed to yep and that's supposed to that's supposed to that's all right looks good yep that's what we want those center pins are always together and the switch works as a switch great okay what's the big analog chip i recognize the 328 good question god i need a i need better eyes you ever consider just going to uh um lee valley and picking up a set of loops oh thank you yeah uh, no I, I i have a couple loops actually at home i just hmm. don't bring them in one uh one dsp or not dsp but oh one... they were asking about uh something that was posted in chat not the board that you're working on oh okay oh you've got a third hand okay. yeah because i'm now i'm curious to be honest as hmm. to what's of the chips on there board we have a stm32 yep that would explain why this is the darling of the uh, the internet the stm32 is a very popular and very well documented chip hmm. in fact it's uh i think the stm32 is related to the esp32 although i could be completely wrong on that do not quote me never quote me hmm. Is, is Get that, that one into Lurbot. <laughs> is that flashing on the front of the griffin there? No, it's a uh, tiny little hammer. Oh. <laughs> for, I guess, for the Sigmarite church. I love that. Yeah, he's got a... Well, that the, 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 yeah, because the, the cleric has a hammer, and then he gave his little yeah. griffin buddy a little, little hammer. Yeah, it's a holy icon, let's say. Flashing on my miniatures. Pause. I was I was confused. That's why I was like, "What the heck's going on here?" Just take me aside next time. Some kind of dime store charlatan. No flashing. Uh, I actually assumed that if it was flashing, you were doing some sort of there's some sort of tricky uh, thing you were doing. So it's like ah, except in this mm. particular instance, you want to paint the base coat then do the flashing yeah, for enough. some reason. I appreciate your vo vote of confidence. There it goes. Thanks, Ocean. <laughs> Got there. Yeah. The best quotes are the ones you shouldn't do. It's like the one from um, when I was playing Bloodborne. One of my favorite quotes in uh, Lurbot is, um, you know, in Bloodborne, you're fighting these giant pigs in the sewers, and uh, you can get around behind them and do the um, oh, yep. the, the, the fisting attack, yep. <laughs> where you reach in and pull up viscera. Uh, but because you just get around a pig, and, you know, you just, like, get right in it's there. big. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Julie was watching me play, and she's like, you just punched him in the anus. Or, or no, she said, he has an anus. And I say... He had an ace. <laughs> or he does now. Oh. Any tips for painting white? Uh, keep your brushes clean. That one's really hard because you're always cross-contaminating your paints. Uh, but it's easily noticeable on white. Trivially noticeable. So it, it helps to work from a palette, especially a wet palette, where you can get your working quantity of paint transferred from your paint pot to the wet palette um and it will be active there for a while uh but base coat um 
I've seen successful base coats starting off at like a tawny brown uh, going up to white for kind of more of a bone look or from a smoky bluish gray up to white uh, to go uh, for, a, for a grayish bluish look. Ooh, Ooh also uh, Arclight mentions that uh, they found a NASA training film from 1960 on YouTube called Soldering Rockets. Rad. That sounds like it'll be fun. Yeah, I, I've seen um, bl sort of grayish blue used as sort of shading on white a lot, especially <laughs> on like fabric, like white robes. And oh, well, I mean, if you want to have oh, a right, look. Right, yeah, of course. <laughs> the cloak on the, the knight. Yeah, there you go. Uh, started off with um, shadow gray and worked up to Vallejo white. Vallejo model color, model color white. And just blending in more and more white. Until finally. Yeah, until you get to the desired color. Um, yeah. So. Uh, really, though, the how to, how to paint white for a white scars army, uh, practice, patience, and the ability to say, good enough, <laughs> good enough, we're done. Uh, also, like, I find a lot of 40k miniatures uh, too busy. For example, like, uh, ultramarines have this lovely, like, deep blue, ultra blue, but they have, like, a lot of yellow trim and a lot of white trim and a lot of like stuff that I find I find the base color on a lot of marines um, very pretty and then it just gets completely overwhelmed by all kinds of crazy crap mm. that they just keep putting on their armors uh, on their armor um, I've seen a blood angels army that was gorgeous and just issued all of the the, the trim around the corners of the, or around the edges of their pauldron and painted that in like red instead uh same thing with an ultramarines army and a um imperial fists army that is supposed to be painted this kind of yellow like this bright bright uh golden yellow but actually just went with a um a brown like a, a khaki um that communicated the bright golden yellow while not being like oh, Hmm, that's a powerful statement you're making <laughs> right there. I mean, I always feel like, like whenever you see the, you know, the whatever, the, the like heavy metal group stuff, mm -hmm. you know, it, it always seems like um, the real test of a model painter is like making like a monochromatic army mm -hmm. still look amazing. Yeah, it's uh, working with a limited palette is the hardest hardest job yeah the idea you know if a guy has all sorts of different little things on it you have lots of color to add definition but if you're just trying to add just add all the shading and stuff on you know just blue or just white or whatever is very mm -hmm. very difficult oh yeah yeah um i would love to see like because typically white scars are the space marines that are based on the mongols and they wear white power armor um but they have their logo is a red band with a golden lightning bolt through it. And they just splash those colors everywhere on their armor, right? Like they have red trim around the corners of their pauldrons. They've got yellow lightning bolts everywhere. And I find it very, um, well, yeah, I mean, 40K is kind of inherently garish, but you can have that look of elaboration without necessarily going whole hog on it. And I don't, I don't know if that's, in, that's probably against the spirit of 40K, which are supposed supposed to be kind of like elaborate and hideous yeah, yeah right in in the mode of like uh because a lot of 40k is a, fa uh, a satire of fascist aesthetics right right uh so you really want to go just like completely over the top and put giant golden eagles on everything and have pillars and laurels and uh, i don't know yeah eagles yeah. more eagles skulls we got skulls yeah we got skulls um so yeah find it where you want to preserve the character of the setting but still want to do something that looks nice. It's it's tricky, right? Oh yeah, their top knots come through their helmets. What? 
Well, I mean, the, the, it's probably just like a, a top knot on top of the helmet. Uh, okay, yeah. I love the idea of like, you know, an army, like a space marine army that, you know, their their armor's all white, but whenever you actually see them in the field, mm -hmm. they're like all like multicolored from just all the like stuff they've been, you know, smashing and walking through. And yeah, yeah, there's just like... So they're just like gray and brown and green and kind of different, all sorts of different colors from various things that they've been pounding on. Oh, yeah, like... um. Uh, there is the the Forge World Marine chapter, the Charcaridons, which are the space sharks. They were called the space sharks originally, and then <laughs> Forge World was like, mm, maybe we can um, just tone it down a little bit. Spin and people are like, pardon me. <laughs> have you played this game? Yeah, space uh, they have, sharks. They they their signature weapon is like. Frequently, Space Marine Terminators have a weapon called a chain fist, which is just like a chainsaw mounted on the end of a uh, power armored fist mm -hmm. right and they put it inside you and then they take it out again and by that point you've stopped noticing it um but the space shark chapter master had chain hands oh where just the entire interior surface of his gauntlets were covered in chainsaws and i'm like that is both the dumbest and the awesomest yeah. thing ever like that sounds efficient th that's somebody understanding 40k on a very base level <laughs> right like, uh, one of their games was called Necromunda, which was, like, the skirmish-level game of gangs fighting in the underhive of a city. And on the cover was a guy holding guns that Rob Liefeld would have gone, mm, That's a little much. A little much. Wow. Uh, and he had a chain hat. <laughs> like, he had a, a hat that was supposed to evoke a mohawk, I think, but it had chainsaws. It was just made out of chainsaws. I mean... And it was awesome. If you have enough chainsaws that you no longer need them for anything, if you have excess chainsaws, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. A hat seems fine. Once you've gone from... There you go. Wow. Wait, no. It must have been the miniature that had a chain hat. Because, yeah, that's just a, that's just a standard mohawk. Mm -hmm. one, of the mi one of the Goliath miniatures had a chain hat. It might have been the guy with the eye patch. I want to say that I remember he had an eye patch. <laughs> from his chain from, hat going from, awry, I guess. Yeah, from uh, putting his. It's like, hey, hey, uh, when did you get that eye patch? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was the older, older Goliath miniatures. I now I want to find out if I can find it. <laughs> I'm going to finish up one more thing here on the analog board, and I think that might be a good time for us to call it a night, because next up is a bunch of resistors for the analog board, and resistors, I need to look up tables and find it, or check the results with a multimeter. In fact, it's telling me, do meter the resistor host. values. Do host me. I'm sorry, I just, it happened and I... No, no, that's, you have to. Saying do. They, they don't say, do they, host. they don't want you to uh, just go by the colors on them? <laughs> I mean, we could, but they're not, the colors aren't mentioned on the instruction sheet. Oh. So I either have to look up the color based or, and rather than or, I think and also check the resistance levels to make sure that they're working properly. But we can at least get these uh, these pins onto this analog board. And then I think that's, that's probably a good place for us to... Rather than both of us getting kitted up for a second full round. Mm. Maybe I'm hallucinating this. Maybe it never happened. Maybe I'm just... Or it's something that can happen, <laughs> and you can be the one to Is do it. One that Yes. Yeah. It was... That's the one on the left! Corvus, you got it. The, the guy with oh the melta gun. Oh my god, that is definitely... The guy with the melta gun. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> Mr. Chainsaw Head. There he is. It's like a uh, taser face in Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy. <laughs> yeah. Or like some kind of tick character. Who was I listening to? Oh, right, it was uh, the new uh, She-Ra. 
Mm -hmm. The character of, uh, God, what's his name? Boat Boy. Swift Talk? I think it's Swift Talk. Let's call it Swift Talk. Mm -hmm. Sounds a lot like a cross between Sean Connery and a Dr. Venture. Ah, and I the can't... Mighty Monarch. I'm s sorry. Um, <laughs> that just happened. Ah. Seahawk, yeah. Seahawk, thank you. Oh, oh. That's two pins soldered together. Uh oh. Now you need the. Um... The braid. Mm. Well, probably don't need the braid. I can probably just get, get some parts using. Again, as you say, capillary action, but. Can get enough solder out of there. Okay, maybe I do need the braid. You're not telling me that people are unfamiliar with Venture Brothers. Am I that old? Are people. Have you caught up on the latest season? Oh, no, I haven't watched it since like 2008. Oh. All I remember really clearly is uh, Brock Samson being everyone's um, man crush. <laughs> but him like standing in the middle of the road. Oh, yes. And, oh, God, that was a uh, As the car bears down on him. Yep. And just like with Zen calmness, he extends one arm outward. And the other. And then just falls, falls back. backwards into the seat. Yep. Crushing the driver and landing in like the classic. Up. Yeah, it was beautiful. Mm. Well, I've got a server you may need to check out then. But uh, oh, the latest season has been quite a ride for Venture fans, in a good way. Neat. Oh man, Space Sharks. Maybe I should build a Space what? Sharks army. Just go, go all in. Just go all in on 40k and do Space Sharks. Yeah, yeah. There's one. That's the uh, that's that's like the door breaching uh, dreadnought fist. Which, I mean, you would think that a dreadnought is just, like, you don't need an extra thing to breach a door. I mean, maybe you do. Dreadnought. Nobody ever accused Marines of having a strong, like, uh, sense of restraint. Especially the space sharks. They're the ones the other Marines look at and go, whoa, okay, take it down to a nice even 50. Could we? <laughs> Good job, me. No... No, no, no bridging cost. on those oh, pins, good. so we're good. All right. Well, I consider that a fairly good episode then at this mm. point because we've got uh, we have managed to stitch together half of half of one side of a bag. Mm. We've completed work on one one miniature, one miniature <laughs> and begun work on the other. I mean, it's, yeah, we're, we're going to get there. Already looking more like a uh, more like a Griffin than it was twenty minutes ago. Oh right, and the reason they call themselves space sharks is because they have this weird mutation where they have rows of teeth. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I remember that bit now. Oh, I just I I probably should get some fam level of familiarity with forty k. Oh, don't bother. It's real <laughs> dumb, but it's awesome. Which is why. Mm. So I think we're gonna call it a uh, an episode there for us then. Uh, on this episode of Tinker Tailor Solar Fry, mm -hmm. I want to thank everyone who uh, who took their time to uh, come and watch with us. I mean, it's been, oh, as usual, a lot of fun to hang out and make stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't take enough time to do that in my home life, so I have to monetize it. Uh, yeah, so we want to thank, of course, all the people who uh, show their support here at Twitch.tv with their bits and their subscriptions, as well as those of you who choose to subscribe at Patreon.com slash Loading Ready Run. Mm -hmm. It really does keep the lights on and helps us keep doing what we love doing and what you love watching. Paul, do you have today's subscribers ready for us to go through? I do. So thank you to these people who subscribed during the stream. Mm -hmm. Starting with Mew Yabby for 26 months. Thank you so much. Exit Pursued by a Bear has come back for the 38th month. Thank you. We ought to thank Friendly Neighborhood GM, who has subscribed for 31 months. Drasfin has come back for the 15th month. Much appreciated. Hodge Gulashi has subscribed for 12 months. Thank you so much for your continued support. Dashiel 
has resubbed for the 45th month. Thank you. Third favorite angel. Hmm. Asterisk, Asterisk Reaper has subscribed for three months. Thank you for so many plosive Ks. <laughs> to Crackshore has resubbed for the 51st month. Here comes Aldenus for 10 months. Thank you so much. Anarin was gifted a sub by Let's Consider. Thank you both. Drazov is back for their 28th month. Thank you so much, Drazov. Captain Ender 7 has come back for the 60th month. Much appreciated. Gotta thank the Grolin for 15 months of subs. Thanks so much, Grolin. Wildfire Bird 123 was gifted a, a sub by Static Display. Gotta thank Eli Pants for three months of subscription. Gravity Pike has reset for the 56th month. God, I keep thinking about what kind of a weapon that would be. Matt Twisto is a brand new subscriber. Thanks for joining the channel and welcome. Mm. Dribrick has come back for, er, uh, decided to show up. Thank you. <laughs> Much appreciated. <laughs> Chronopticon has subscribed for three months. Thank you so much. Ganja Shimata has come back for the ninth month. Congratulations on your sub, baby. Yeah. Herbert Erpaderp has subscribed for 18 months. I'll ignore that underscore just for that wonderful hmm. syncopation. The exact same has come back for the 24th month. Happy two year anniversary. Yes. And big thanks to Earthen One and Xanto69 for those 101 bit stub bits. Bit stub bits. bits. Ah, <sighs> good episode. Mm. Good week so far. But, Paul, what do we have coming up in the week ahead? We've got the crapshoot. Oh. Coming up uh, tomorrow. Uh, the uh, Now Kiss uh, was on the schedule for uh, tomorrow, but mm -hmm. uh, not going to be doing that. So the crap shoot is going to be first thing going on tomorrow, 1 o'clock, uh, where we're going to be shooting some crap shots, possibly editing one. Ooh, it's a shoot and edit day. Mm. Uh, and then we got Friday Night Paper Fight. Mm. Highlander. Going to be playing some Canadian Highlander. Yep. It's uh, uh, It'll be Jeremy White, mm -hmm. uh, Ben Wheeler. Ooh, wheels. Uh, Ben, Ben, Ben Ulmer. Oh, wow. Double Ben. Ben yeah. Ben Engineering. Ben Engineering. Mm -hmm. And me. I will be playing my Mardu Aristocrats deck. Mm, that uh, sounds fun. Yeah. So show up, watch, watch me get stomped in Highlander. And uh, yeah, it'll be good. Be a good time. And on f Saturday, we got a Loading Ready Live coming back at 6 p.m. Yeah, mm -hmm. our, our uh, returning Loading Ready Live after uh, Desert Quest. Yeah, wow. We've we really need this. <laughs> uh, and then Rhythm Cafe. Yep, we'll be rounding out again. Gal Metal, which has been a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah, more fun than I think we had any expectations of it being. Nice. I'm really happy with that. And then uh, on Monday, we're back to Checkpoint Plus and uh, all those other fun things going on next week. Uh, mm. So make sure you check out that schedule to yeah. find out. All no dice friends yet on mm. Monday. No. Just for those of you who might be wondering. But yes, check out loadingreadyrun.com for all the great shows, both pre-recorded and streamed in nature. Or mm -hmm. uh, the events page, too, just above the uh, video. Uh, just above the stream, if you click on events, get, it's right get, there. Get, 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 get right, right down in there. Mm. Ooh, disappear. All right. So that brings us to an end of our broadcast day here at Loading Ready Run. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. And we will see you next time, ever forward. Never learning.